the uh, R Studio cheat sheet. See, it's funny because I came here last year and I and I had uh, I had R Studio installed on my laptop, and that was you know and I wrote R code here, and that was big news. And this year, well, I don't have my laptop attached here, but this year I have in my backpack a Windows laptop, and so I'm thinking, you know, how can I escalate this further? Like maybe my maybe my talk next year will be about Excel, perhaps. <laughs> yeah, we'll see. So, th so this is my third year running at um, New York R Conference. Thanks, Jared, for uh, tolerating my tolerating my presence. Um, I, I I think also my my talks have my my technical talks have uh, have gotten less and less accessible as years have gone by. But um, I've also been moving uh, lower and lower in the stack. And what's been really interesting is that I find myself. Uh, working on problems which um, ha are relevant significantly beyond the the Python community, and um, and and these days a lot of the software that that I'm building and working on is not Python specific at all, and you know one of my hopes over the next um, you know over the next years is to kind of build a community of developers who are building uh, infrastructure and systems that benefit the the entire data science community, and software that can be used from R can be used from Python from Julia. Uh, from many different programming languages. And we can expect, you know, over the next 10 or 20 years that there will be other, um, that, you know, Python and R are not the be all end all of um, open source data science. There will be other programming languages and other, uh, other environments. And, you know, I think, you know, we need to think about how we can make our software sustainable and, and interoperable with these other, um, the, these other tool ecosystems. So I've gotten involved in the um, Apache Big Data ecosystem. I'm working on, my book is now five years old, so I'm working on updating it this year. So there should be a new edition uh, out at some point this year. Hopefully we'll make it out in 2017. Um, mandatory legal disclaimer. So, so this talk is about some of the challenges to sharing data between um, not just data science languages, but, but for the purposes of this talk, I mean, we can restrict our view of the world to, to data science languages like, like Python and R. So we'll talk about why we would want to do that and why it's difficult. I, I've been uh, helping build a new open source project called Apache Arrow, which is a, a tool which helps with creating um, interoperable data. Um, we'll talk about some of the ways that, that our communities can, can work together for the, for the greater good. So I feel like a bit of a broken record and that, th so my last two talks at, at New York R Conference a year ago was, okay, data interoperability, April 2015, data frames, the good, the bad, and the ugly. So I've been talking a lot about data frames. Well, a l about a year and a half before that, I gave a talk in 2013 called 10 Things I Hate About Pandas. Um, that was actually the subtitle, but I'm going with that as the, the official title. But Pandas is now a nine-year-old code base. I, I started it, it was a closed source project that I started in April 2008. And I've, now Pandas is a very successful project in the Python world. And I've been looking at many different problems around around the data science ecosystem. And one of the big ones is, you know, how, how could building something like Pandas or building something like our data frames be made easier and more reproducible? Um, and so I've kind of trended downward in the stack and looking at, okay, what are the, tw you know, if you wanted to build data frames, like if you wanted to build a new data frame library, a, you know, version of Pandas in JavaScript or in, you know, in you know, really any language that can call C or C++ libraries, you know, what would that technology look like? And what are the kinds of things that we can get a group of um, data scientists to, to agree on? Um, and this kind of ha is, is all in the context of the, cha the, the backdrop of, of the changing hardware landscape in that memory is becoming very fast and very cheap. So Intel just released a new type of solid state drive, which they, you know, they claim um, has a thousand times better performance than NAND-based flash drives. It's cheaper on a per gigabyte basis than, than RAM. And so, you know, you can see where, like, where this is trending, that, you know, in the future, we are going to have 
well, lots of machines with lots of disk and memory that's about the same performance. And so the bottlenecks in our applications are going to be how fast can we get data, get access to data in the format that we need it to be able to run your algorithms on it. So if that, so if, so if getting data into, into the right structure to be able to run your analytics code, your statistical models, if that is expensive, that will become you know, the major bottleneck um, in, in the future. And so nowadays, you know, we, ha we also have a lot of next generation AI frameworks coming out of industry research labs. Um, you know, the reality of building productionalized data science is that you will have to plug together, plug together many components. So it might be that R or Python or Julia is where you're doing all of your primary data preparation, data cleaning, feature engineering, but then you need to hand that data off to some other, some other system. So thinking about you know, the, how expensive it is to move, to move data at those points of contact between systems and how to feed data as efficiently into our machine learning frameworks um, so is another thing that, you know, that we should be collectively worrying a lot about. So one common theme that I, you know, in blog posts and, and on the internet and in, in talks that I've been talking a lot about is this idea of building um, interfaces to memory that don't, require, uh, that don't require copying. And so copying can mean many different things. It might be that you need to copy data out of a file into, into RAM. Or it might be that you have to convert data from one format in RAM to another format. Um, so if you're dealing with large data sets that don't, that don't fit in RAM or that are in some kind of a, like a hybrid scenario where half, you know, most of the data set is on disk, but you've, you've memory, maybe you've memory mapped that file and some of the data is in RAM. And so internally in your algorithms, you have a data access layer that is dealing with, okay, I need to you know, load, you know, materialize this portion of the data set into a form where I can run my algorithm which, which expects to receive a chunk of data that's all in RAM, kind of in memory. So if you have interfaces that enable you to run your algorithms on the data simply by inspecting the metadata to say, okay, I know what shape, like how long this array is, this is a data frame, I know what its column names are, its column types are, if you can convert strictly the schema representation into a form that R understands or Python understands without actually, uh, and, and be able to operate on that data in C2 without any additional conversion, you get a great deal of, of efficiency from um, kind of doing that, that engineering work and not having to you know, move the data around to, to process it. But this is very difficult because any, any given programming environment has different notions of what is, what is a type. There's different um, levels of granularity and like what is an integer. You know, R has its own notion of, you know, integers are 32-bit numbers. I don't know if there's 64-bit integers now. Um, some, some environments have eight integer types. Um, you know, some have more than, more than eight integer types. And so, you know, it might be that one, you know, one language says, here's some data, but it's 16-bit signed integers. And if you want to run your algorithms in R on the data, you have to, you know, for every value, you have to cast that integer to a form because you have code that expects 32-bit integers. That, um, that's complicated. There's also the, you know, particular, you know, if you just go down to the bits and bytes kind of in memory, how is that, how is that data represented? And what assumptions can we make about how the data is represented in memory. And if you're programming in C or C++, and thankfully, you know, the R community has been doing a lot more C++ programming, so we have something we can, uh, we can collaborate on more easily. Um, but if you're all, you know, if you're using different, different in-memory data structures and you want to um, you know, hand off data between all data that is in RAM, you have to deal with a mapping between your different you know, in-memory data frames. And so, you know, when Hadley and I were working on, you know, working on Feather, you know, that was one of the core problems. Like, oh, we have, we both have data frames, but our data frames look different at the, at the C level. So, if you think about, you know, what, what, is, what is the Pandas project at a low level? So we built a, a data frame. If you go back to 2008, uh, Python didn't have, didn't really have data frames or, or something that worked like, like the, data the data structures in R. And 
you know, for a variety of reasons, I wanted to, to, do this in, to do this in Python. And fast forward almost a decade later, and we have this gigantic project with our own CSV readers and our own, you know, we have IO interfaces to just about everything. We have our own implementation of the kinds of things that you find in base R and dplyr and um, plyr and reshape2. And all of these things are, are all in pandas because we made a lot of decisions at the low level about how we, you know, what, what the internals of, of a data frame looks like. And we're using NumPy arrays as all of the uh, kind of the lowest level, you know, the, the NumPy array is the container that holds the, m the memory pointer and that handles, okay, you're done with this data, I'm going to, you know, release this memory back, back to the operating system. But NumPy is, is kind of an awkward choice for, for building a data frame library because, because NumPy is a, um, a multi-dimensional array library and it's the in vogue thing, and the machine learning community is to call these things tensors, and I know that mathematicians and physicists get really upset when you call, um, when you call ND arrays tensors, but for the, just for the sake of naming things is hard, it turns out, so we'll just call them tensors. But, but, but tensors are, are a, a more rigid construct. You could have a seven-dimensional seven tensor, but the slots, the values in the, in the, in the object typically are, are fixed size values. So dealing with, dealing with strings is, is, is hard. Um, and it's, it's a very, you know, very, it's a memory layout that is good for building algorithms, but for dealing with heterogeneous data, it, it is very difficult. It can be very difficult. And so, you know, after a decade of development against NumPy, you know, we've, we've suffered from you know, many of these issues, not having um, null values, you know, NA values built into the, built into the memory model, um, having, um, you know, some of the complexities of dealing with multi-dimensional data all the time. Most of the time, our, our data is one-dimensional, so the additional, um, keeping track of all of the dimension data uh, makes things more complex. And of course, a lot of data is strings and data analysis, um, and that's, um, you know, we've had to build a lot of custom code just for dealing with, just for dealing with strings. So, a summary of all this, and I'll kind of blow through all this stuff, and, and um, you know, for those who are really interested and want to get involved in, in this effort, we can talk later. But my, my thesis is that the two kinds of data that are easiest to share between programming languages are the tensor, which is the multi-dimensional array object where all the values are the same type, and table-like data, and that's effectively a more generalized version of an, of an R data frame. So a little over a, little over a year ago, I, um, I, I, I helped co uh, get, get together a group of um, mainly uh, Apache-based um, kind of people who, who mostly work on Apache projects, uh, big data developers, to create um, the Apache Arrow project. And our idea was many different projects had created their own variants of in-memory data frames. And we said, wouldn't it be great if we had a, an open source specification for what is a data frame-like object in memory that can handle more complex data types, like nested you know, JSON-like data, that we have a way of talking about data types and the structure of data sets in a, in a language agnostic way. And we could build a, a messaging layer so that we can send and receive data very cheaply between Java code, C++ code. And of course, if things are C or C++ based, then you can move them from Python to R without doing any extra work. And so, you know, my, my mental model, um, you know, for, for the way the project works is that rather than having to build custom uh, adapters to move from one environment to another, you can have many systems essentially partying on the data. Um, and you know you can build algorithms that target that target that memory model. Hence, it is a bit of a chicken and egg problem. In the absence of algorithms that target that memory model, you can't really do that much interesting stuff with it right now. Um, but you know, my hope is that in time we will be able to. So the high level high level things we've been focused on in the project is having a concrete and um, you know hardened uh, memory model that works in the way that you know, our data frames, pandas data frames, has, has the kind of semantics that we're looking for. You can pull values out of, out of a data set in constant time. We have a messaging layer for moving data between in and out of files, in and out of memory maps, through sockets, 
um, over HTTP where you can receive a payload of data and immediately begin processing it without doing any additional conversion in memory. And that's, this is the part of the library that's the most complete right now. So between now and a year ago, um, you know, we've spent, we've spent uh, you know, the last year essentially hardening the, uh, you know, the data types and, uh, and the messaging layer. So we have implementations uh, in, in Java and C++, and we have tests that pass data from Java to C++ and back and make sure that both, both libraries think that the data is the same. And what's cool is right now we're starting to see you know, bindings develop in other languages. So, uh, so a Japanese, uh, Japanese developer contributed C bindings to the C++ libraries and is using a, a, a remarkable uh, kind of automated language binding tool called G-Object Introspection to create Ruby bindings. And so now we have all of these Ruby unit tests in the arrow code base, which is um, pretty cool and, and awesome at the same time. So, I've been giving a lot of talks about Arrow, and many people say, well, what about, what about Feather? So if you think about, if you, if you look at the, the Feather project, Hadley and I got together in you know, February or, or March um, last, last year, and this was right before we announced the Arrow project, and I told him about it. And, um, you know, and he, he said, well, wouldn't it be cool if we had something like a, like a typed CSV that was really fast to read and write, and we could read and write it from both Python and R? And um, I said, well, shipping this within the Arrow project because Arrow has a much larger scope would be a bit complicated. So we um, spent about two weeks and we hacked together, hacked together Feather and released it as, a, um, as an open source project. Um, and so as the, as the Arrow project has matured and, and generalized, in, in March I, I merged the C++ and Python portions of Feather back into the Arrow code base and we will be continuing to do Feather development. Um, with the, the guts of the, the project living within, uh, within the Apache Arrow project. So I'm looking for a, a champion developer who, who does some RCPP and uh, cares about um, data interoperability to, to lead development on the R bindings. If you or, or anyone um, you know is interested in that, um, in, in that project, we, we, should, uh, we should talk. So the... Um, so the C++ libraries itself, I, them, themselves, and I know there's more and more C++ programmers in, in the R community. So what I've tried to do is build a easy to use, as far as C++ is easy to use, but a reasonably easy to use um, foundation for building um, data frame like things in memory. So there is a so there is a memory management memory management layer, a way to describe um, the schemas of tables. And there's actually, then there's data structures which define things like what is an integer array, what is a uh, list of lists array. Um, then there is the messaging, the messaging system which enables you to receive, you know, a gigabyte of data and run analytics on that, on that data without doing any, any copying in memory. And making all of these tools compose and have a nice, nice API at the sea level has been a lot of work. Um, and I'm, you know, that's really what I've been doing um, mostly for the last 12 months since I was last here. So well, I don't have too much time to talk about the code, so I will fast forward and you can read about some of the pieces of the library. We just added a, a tensor type so that you can use the same um, memory tools in Arrow to, uh, to send and receive tensor data. An exciting project where we're, um, where um, is an organic use of, of Arrow is a, is a new machine learning framework out of the Berkeley RISE lab, which is effectively the successor to the, to the Berkeley AMP lab, and they're focused on real-time machine learning, uh, things like reinforcement learning. And so what, what, what they've done is they, they built a, a distributed shared memory object store for, st for storing you know, tensors and, and tabular data. And they're using the Arrow C++ libraries as the in-memory data plane, like memory management, dealing with memory lifetime, and, and the kind of putting and getting of complex objects in, in uh, shared memory. So it's really cool to see uh, a framework like this develop and, and to get used to build really high performance machine learning. And I think we'll see more and more systems architected in this fashion because all of the marshalling of data between, between worker nodes doesn't make as much sense if you can put everything um, in shared memory and operate on data directly without having to do all of this, all of this extra conversion. We also um, have been planning a, a major renovation of the, the Pandas project itself. 
And one of the goals of, of this is actually to make the pandas library smaller and have less Python specific code. So we're uh, so we're going to be moving a lot of the um, you know some of the low level analytics and algorithms um, out of pandas and into uh, Python agnostic uh, C++ uh, that we can call from call from Python. Um, it will also help decouple pandas from um, from some of the kind of hard coded assumptions that we've made about using NumPy arrays internally, and with the goal of being able to um, to better take advantage of uh, big machines with lots of cores and lots of RAM. So that's uh, that's my talk. I um, sorry to wear everyone out with absurd technical detail, but I, I think this is a I think this is a really important problem and and, I th and something for you know our communities to collaborate on and and um, you know I think as far as sustainability of the software that we're building and making it all work well together, that having you know specifications and designs around these problems um, that are language as language agnostic as possible will be really helpful for building consensus and um, you know helping kind of create code that we can can all use and make make each other more more productive. So thank you.